One day they were here, full of life and laughter, and the next, they were gone. But in the darkness, a glimmer of hope emerged. Stories began to surface of a strange coincidence. Whispers in the night and shadows seen where they shouldn't be. A feeling that something dark and evil was watching, waiting. And as details of the murders unfolded, so did the questions. Who could commit such heinous acts? What was their motive? And what made their deaths even more terrifying was how elusive their killer seemed until a sudden arrest made everything even scarier. Perhaps the most unusual of all is just how strong the case against Koberger appears from the beginning. Eyewitness? Check. Video surveillance of his car? Check. DNA match? Check. Implicating cell phone records? Loads. And as of May, the prosecution produced roughly 10,000 pages of documents and over 10,000 photos along with massive amounts of video and audio data in the case. But first, we need to go back to the night of November 13th when Zana Kernoodle, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Goncalves were all viciously attacked while sleeping in an off-campus townhouse. They were all stabbed and murdered with premeditation, and although everything that happened after their deaths would become international news, the lead-up to the quadruple homicide was pretty normal for college students. An intruder, or intruders, had simply entered the house, stabbed to death four of the six sleeping students inside, and then quietly slipped into the night. And as the University of Idaho community struggled to come to terms with the killings and cope with the fear of the perpetrator, local and federal investigators were hard at work. By late December, despite the massive amount of resources devoted to the investigation, along with a stream of steady case updates, the case appeared to be on the verge of going cold. But on December 30th, Moscow police announced they had made an arrest in the case. Brian Koberger, who had no apparent connection to any of the victims until the family searched Kaylee's Instagram follower list and saw he had liked some of their pictures. He was a graduate student at a neighboring university with an unsettling history and an obsession of true crime. The abrupt identification of the alleged killer and the excavation of his personal background meant that one of the most senseless and shocking crimes in recent memory became even more tragic. Had four devoted friends, two of whom were dating and two who were lifelong best friends, lost their lives to a would-be serial killer? The affidavit as well as the wealth of information that has trickled in about the case and the alleged perpetrator sheds new light on an extraordinarily horrific crime and the equally extraordinary criminal investigation that followed it. What finally led to his arrest was simply excellent investigative work, a mix of well-organized policing, groundbreaking forensics using genetic genealogy, and old-fashioned detective work. As the killer heads to trial, the secrets of the criminal they caught are still being unearthed. The murders of Zaina Kernoodle, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan and Kaylee Goncalves were all University of Idaho undergrads. Zaina was a junior majoring in marketing who was dating Ethan, a sports management major. Madison and Kaylee had been inseparable since the sixth grade and did everything together. Lived together, went to school together, and ultimately died side by side. On the night of Saturday, November 12th, 2022, everything seemed normal. Zaina and Ethan went to a party at the Sigma Chi fraternity, and Madison and Kaylee went out to a bar, then hung out at a food truck for a little while. Then by around 2 a.m. Sunday, everyone had gathered at the house on King Road where Madison, Kaylee, and Zaina lived with two other roommates, but Kaylee had recently moved out of the townhouse as she prepared to graduate early and take a job in Texas, so she returned for the weekend to hang out with Madison. Months later, this news would fuel public speculation that whoever was watching the house saw her return and saw it as an opportunity which is very possible. The three-story house was accessible primarily by a secure door with a coded entry on the bottom floor, as well as by a sliding glass door on the main level or second floor of the house. The lower entry was locked, but the sliding glass door might have been more easily accessible, and this is where my area of expertise comes in. My background was in multifamily housing, and at times I had to outsmart and prevent people like the killer from getting into houses or apartments because whether we like it or not, odds are someone is going to try to get in at some point. People break in just about anywhere, and if the intruder finds a weak link, they will exploit it, and the three biggest weak links of that townhouse start with the sliding glass doors, even if they were locked. Most sliding glass doors locks can be defeated in less than two seconds, and with zero evidence of entry. Then the horizontal sliding windows may be easiest of all. But this method of entry is going to leave damage, and the most unsurprising vulnerability is that keypad. 
We know the killer had been stalking and driving by repeatedly due to his cell phone data, and he could have been close enough or had binoculars to see what anyone was typing into that keypad. But most importantly, it's almost all these types of door locks lock automatically so that the door stays locked 24-7. The key point in any crime scene like this is the evidence or actual damage that is left behind. And if there is no damage, the killer either saw them type in the code, a sliding glass door or window was unlocked, or he defeated the lock on one of the sliding doors or windows, which is what I think he did due to a statement made by one of the surviving roommates who witnessed him escape out the second floor sliding glass doors and it's only one of these three. Now around 4 a.m., Zayna ordered Jack in the Box, and at 4.12 a.m., she was on her phone surfing TikTok. But sometime in the next few minutes, the attack began, and she tried to fight off her attacker, but by 4.25 a.m., Zayna and Ethan would both be dead. The killer attacked on the second and third floors of the house, entering each of the victim's rooms for separate attacks, but he left the roommates on the main and lowest levels alive, he used a large knife, similar to the style used by the U.S. Marine Corps, and nearby surveillance footage even captured audio of the attacks around 4.17 a.m., including distress sounds and barking from Kaylee's dog. One roommate told police she heard noises and crying, but she didn't understand what she was hearing. Although she opened her door repeatedly to see what was happening, she saw nothing alarming. But at this point, she did report hearing Kaylee say, There's someone here, and moments later, sounds of crying came from Zana's room. She heard a male voice say, it's okay, I'm going to help you. But the third time she opened her door, she saw a man in all black wearing a mask, walking toward her as she stood frozen in shock. The killer walked right past her, but it's unclear whether or not he saw her. With his face mostly covered, the roommate noted the only thing she could see, clearly, was the suspect's bushy eyebrows, and that detail would later prove accurate. So, still in shock, the roommate returned to her room and locked her door while the killer exited through the sliding glass door on the apartment's main floor. Then, he vanished. So, on Sunday at 11.58 a.m., 911 received a phone call from a roommate's phone, during which multiple people at the scene spoke to the dispatcher. The 911 call has not been released, but there's been an enormous amount of confusion due to reports of an unconscious person at the scene, but police later clarified that the surviving roommates summoned friends to the residence because they believed one of the second floor victims had passed out and was not waking up and this statement led to even more widespread confusion from the public and about how a bloody crime scene involving multiple fatalities could have been so misunderstood and misreported. News of the deaths broke. So many students on campus fled school that the university decided to allow students an early optional Thanksgiving break. Concerned calls to 911 skyrocketed, and residents expressed fear of a Ted Bundy-like predator stalking and choosing their victims randomly. Early police statements didn't help clear this up either. After initially releasing contradictory statements about whether the attack had been personal or random, but police finally settled on the conclusion that it was an isolated, targeted attack but that they had not concluded if the target was the residence or its occupants. Online sleuths immediately latched onto the murders, with speculation running wild both locally and online. Police released body cam footage taken the night of the murders from unrelated nearby interactions, and it's unclear if the footage led to tips that proved useful in Koberger's eventual arrest. But it did lead to a flurry of rumors and speculation that some blurry motion in the background of the video might be a group of people running from the crime scene. So, on the hunt for clues, people poured over the four victims' social media, accusing everyone from their friends to random people who showed up in the background of Instagram photos and the food truck, which ran a Twitch live stream, became a huge source of public speculation, with people examining footage of Kaylee and Madison hanging out by the truck, looking for any clues that someone may have been stalking the two women. Police had to issue statements formally clearing multiple people, and one animal of suspicion, including the surviving roommates and ex-boyfriend of one of the victims who she repeatedly called the night of the attack, a random man who was at the food truck, and most bizarrely, a University of Idaho professor who was accused for the crime by a TikToker who is currently being sued by the professor, but that wild side note in this morbid case lends an idea of how chaotic things look from the sidelines. A horrific crime with somewhat of a lack of witnesses, no significant leads, and a lack of serious suspects, but plenty of distracting, unhelpful social media noise. Then, on December 7th, police asked the public for help locating a white Hyundai Elantra that had been spotted at the crime scene, and it seemed to many people to be less like a promising lead and more like busy work. 
I mean, after all, a generic white car? What could be more of a needle in a haystack, right? But as improbable as it seemed, the detective's focus on that generic white car was exactly right. And five days after the murders, a criminology doctoral student at Washington State University changed the title on his white 2015 Hyundai Elantra before driving it cross-country from Idaho to his parents' home in Pennsylvania. But his attempts to prevent authorities from tracing the car, however, overlooked one thing. Police had his DNA. What's striking about the investigation into Koberger is the affidavit makes clear is both how quickly police honed in on him as a person of interest and how seamlessly multiple law enforcement agencies worked together to apprehend him, collaborating across multiple states, jurisdictions, and even the country. The first big lead in the case came from nearby surveillance footage, which captured a white sedan repeatedly circling the neighborhood between 3.20 a.m. and 4.20 a.m. Police tracked the car to Pullman, Washington, about 10 miles away, home to the Washington State University campus. Meanwhile, an FBI expert identified the make and model and even narrowed down the year range of the car to a 2014-2016 Hyundai Elantra. And with that detail in hand, WSU campus police officers quickly tracked down a Hyundai Elantra owner who attended the school and lived near the last place the car had been seen on surveillance the night of November 13th. And by November 29th, just over two weeks after the murders, the Moscow Police Department had a copy of Koberger's driver's license photo, complete with his bushy eyebrows. Cell phone records showed his phone traveling from Pullman in the direction of Moscow the night of the murders, before it was shut off completely between 2.47 a.m. and 4.48 a.m., consistent with his attempts to conceal his location during the quadruple homicide and also disposing of the murder weapon before turning his phone back on, which could be an enormous clue to investigators who are trying to recover the murder weapon. Odds are he disposed of the knife in whatever the nearest water source is nearby in that area. They also showed him returning to the crime scene in Moscow at approximately 9 a.m. the same morning, still several hours before authorities would even be alerted and then immediately returning to his house in Pullman. So he was returning to the crime scene to try and recover the holster for the knife that he knows has his DNA or just coincidentally returning to a place where he had been casing for weeks and months on end for no apparent reason other than, as his lawyer says, to look at the stars. I call bullshit. That type of coincidence is impossible. He's already made clear he's into true crime and not nature or astrology for that matter. But while authorities had strong circumstantial evidence tying him and his white car to the crime scene, the smoking gun in this case had been recovered from the crime scene on the first day of the investigation, that empty knife sheath. With a trace of DNA from an unknown male and armed with this clue, authorities turned to the groundbreaking technique that's led to arrest in many cases since the 2018 arrest of the Golden State Killer genetic DNA matching. In this process, investigators upload DNA to genealogy websites and then build out a potential family tree for a suspect, or in many cases, an unidentified missing person. Then, using context clues and other practical detective work, they follow the family tree and trace which member is most likely to be a match. So, police were able to match the DNA on the knife sheath with DNA from Koberger's father, gathered from his trash at his parents' home, and that match was definitive, excluding 99.9% .9 of the population from being the father of the suspect. So at this point, Koberger and his dad embarked on a multi-day road trip from Washington to Pennsylvania. License plate readers across the country mapped them traveling from state to state, Colorado, Indiana, Pennsylvania, and on December 15th, they were stopped twice by Indiana patrol officers in a very short time span for tailgating. A law enforcement source said the task force, which had him under surveillance, requested that the Indiana troopers pull him over, specifically so they could get a glimpse of his hands to see if there were any cuts or other injuries, and in body cam footage of one of the two stops, they appear only briefly on camera but the FBI later denied that it had given any orders to entrap him, so it's unclear if the task force was acting independently or if the two stops were a complete coincidence. Now, on December 30th, after surveilling him, the Pennsylvania State Police executed a raid on his parents' house in Chestnut Hill Township, smashing windows and breaking doors, so after being extradited back to Idaho, he appeared in the Lata County District Court in Moscow and documents related to his arrest were unsealed by the court, and that was the first time the world would hear of it. But internet sleuths quickly got to work, uncovering his strange and dark background, 
with one student describing him as physically and emotionally abusive that got so, so bad that they just shut down when he was around. Graduated in 2018 with an associate degree, then went on to study criminology at DeSales University as a grad student. And while he was there, took classes under legendary forensic profiler Catherine Ramsland, a household name in the world of true crime, thanks to her long career and dozens of books covering famous cases. He also participated in a research study into criminal behavior, where he recruited convicted criminals on Reddit using an eerie and chilling description. This study seeks to understand the story behind your most recent criminal offense, with an emphasis on your thoughts and feelings throughout your experience which to me sounds exactly like what a serial killer would say. So, after getting his master's degree, he began studying at WSU as a criminal, criminology and criminal justice doctoral student. There are striking similarities between Koberger and the Golden State Killer. Both men gravitated to law enforcement. D'Angelo was a police officer, and Koberger worked as a security guard for a local school district and had recently applied for an internship with his local police department, claiming... He wanted to aid law enforcement with data collection and analysis. They both had suspicious newspaper write-ups for small acts of valor they had performed, and both men also cased their crime scenes extensively. Phone records showed Koberger returning to the area of the King Road house again and again. On the, at least 12 occasions, beginning in June 2022, which was as far back as the police could obtain records. That might be significant for multiple reasons. One of the rumors police downplayed about the case was that Kaylee had expressed fear of a stalker in the weeks prior to the murders, which led to heated debate that she was the focus of the attack. But authorities have never confirmed this. That arrest affidavit is impressive, and impressive might be an understatement. The swiftness with which police managed to identify and carefully build a strong case against him track him across the country and arrest him, all the while working with multiple agencies and somehow managing to keep his identity from leaking to the public is extremely rare. It's even more extraordinary given how many victims were involved, how unusual the crime was, how many agencies were involved, and how intense the public and media scrutiny was. To me, he seems to have been working the criminal justice system in order to become a better criminal. Each half of this case is a cold counter to the other. On one hand, a picture of what we all desperately want policing to look like, and on the other, a picture of what the criminal justice system too often becomes, exploitable. Still, it's easy to imagine this investigation becoming a major case study for what effective policing can and should look like. Law enforcement working with the community and with each other and building the case methodically, based solely on the evidence. Perhaps most unusual of all is just how strong the case against him appears from the outset. Eyewitness? Check. Video surveillance of his car? Check. DNA match? Check again. Implicoting cell phone records? Loads. So in May, apparently in order to avoid a preliminary hearing, the prosecution impaneled a secret grand jury, which indicted him on four felony charges of first-degree murder and one charge of burglary. And at this arraignment, he chose to stand silent when asked to plead to the charges, so the court entered a plea of not guilty on his behalf. But for now, Apart from the probable cause affidavit, the details of the case against him are still limited and is currently under a gag order that's led to repeated courtroom challenges from both victims' families and media outlets. And at a hearing on the gag order, Lataw County Judge John commented on the irreparable harm the media had done to the case. Without going into specifics and worried the case's high-profile media coverage would make it impossible for him to receive a fair trial, but at this point in America, we all know the only fairness in a courtroom comes from the crooked or truthful judge. Now don't we, Judge John? So despite the gag order, new information continues to trickle out. His university even investigated him for various complaints, including following one student to her car and getting into repeated altercations with his supervising professor that ultimately resulted in his termination shortly after the murders. He received complaints for condescending behavior and harsher grading towards female students. And during that same period, he allegedly broke into the home of a woman and then offered to install security cameras on her behalf. And perhaps most damningly, after he went home for the holidays, he acted suspiciously and constantly wore latex gloves around the house, freaking his family members out so much that at one point his disturbed relatives searched his car themselves looking for evidence of his involvement in the murders. 
Even as media coverage shifts away from Zaynan Kernoodle, Ethan Chapin, Kaylee Goncalves, and Madison Mogan and their surviving roommates to focus on the killer, it's important not to let his story supersede theirs. They leave us a legacy of living life to the fullest with joy, love, and friendship that shines throughout the wide digital footprint of the student's social media. In a now-famous Instagram post made on the day of the murders, Kaylee snapped several photos of her roommate saying she's one lucky girl to be surrounded by these people every day. Thanks for watching.